Hello, I'm Glenn Patterson. Several lectures in this course emphasize that water is often a scarce and precious resource that needs to be carefully stored, allocated, and conserved. But as we know, water is unevenly distributed, and too much of a good thing can also be a problem. We're looking at the mouth of the Big Thompson Canyon, a few miles west of Loveland, Colorado. The Big Thompson River flows from its headwaters in Rocky Mountain National Park through the town of Estes Park and down through this canyon on its way to the Great Plains and its confluence with the South Platte River. US 36 follows the river through the canyon, passing numerous cabins and resorts along the way. On July 31, 1976, a huge thunderstorm stalled over the mountains just east of Estes Park and dumped a foot of rain in just four hours. That night, the water level in the Big Thompson River abruptly rose 20 feet, creating a raging flood that demolished roads, campgrounds, cabins, and resorts. It was Colorado's deadliest flood. Heroic action saved many of the 4,000 people who were in the canyon, but 143 people lost their lives in the churning water. Many observers were sure they had witnessed a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and the people who rebuilt the highway felt it would have a good chance of withstanding future floods. But as we film this video, construction crews are hard at work again, 37 years later, rebuilding the same highway after it was once again destroyed by a flood on the Big Thompson River. During September 8 through 15, 2013, a heavy flow of warm, moist air from the south collided with a stationary cold front, dropping as much as 17 inches of rain on the same mountains. This time the rainfall was more widespread and eight South Platte tributaries rose to flood levels. Fortunately, this time there were fewer tourists in the canyon, there was a little more time for warning, and we had learned some lessons from 1976 about flood safety and floodplain management. These factors helped keep a loss of life to nine this time in the whole flooded region. But again, Highway 36 in this canyon and other roads in similar canyons were washed out, structures were damaged and destroyed, and people were stranded for days. These and many more similar occurrences remind us that while water is a precious resource, its uneven distribution in space and time can also make it a powerful agent of destruction. The topic of this lecture, not surprisingly, is water disasters. We'll talk about what type of disasters are related to water, what kind of damages they cause, how they occur, how people respond to them, and what can be done to reduce disaster losses. These images from the 1976 Big Thompson flood remind us of the destructive power of a flooding river. The storm was typical of a flash flood, starting with a huge thunderstorm that remained parked over the mountains near Estes Park for 24 hours while it dropped a foot of rain. The thin soils and steep slopes did not allow much water to infiltrate into the soil, so nearly all the water ran off quickly into streams. The steep, narrow canyon quickly funneled the flood into the confined channel where the water level and velocity both rose abruptly and dramatically. The pictures from 2013 from the same place carry the same message of destruction. This time, the atmosphere over the southwestern states was like an airborne river of moist air flowing in from the subtropical Pacific Ocean, converging from the southeast on the front range of the Rockies. The Big Thompson floods are not unique. Floods are one of the most frequent and destructive of natural disasters. Colorado, a fairly dry state most of the time, has had its share of destructive floods. And floods can be even larger and more destructive in other areas around the world. Floods on steep mountain canyons tend to be flash floods, as we saw before. On the other hand, widespread rain and snowmelt 
over large, flatter river basins cause big rivers to rise more slowly, but remain over flood stage for longer periods of weeks or months. Flooding is a natural part of the variability of the hydrologic regime of a river, but when floodwaters encounter people and their structures and farms, significant damage occurs. Large natural floods occur less frequently than smaller ones and have a lower probability of occurring in any given year. This flood frequency or probability relationship for a given point on a river can be depicted in a graph such as this. Floods near the top of the graph are larger in terms of water flow than floods lower down on the graph. The average frequency of occurrence for a flood of a given magnitude is shown on the bottom axis in terms of recurrence interval, the average number of years between floods of this magnitude. The probability of occurrence during a given year is shown on the top axis. In the example shown, a flood of 1800 cubic meters per second has an average recurrence interval of 10 years and a probability of occurrence of 10% in any given year. So this could be known as a 10-year flood. To construct a curve like this, you need a fairly long series, at least 30 years or so, of annual peak flows. Of course, the 1% or 100-year flood may occur in back-to-back -back years, but statistically speaking, the average recurrence interval over a long period would be 100 years. Most floods are caused by natural events such as precipitation, but some are caused or exacerbated by failure of artificial structures such as dams. The most destructive dam break flood in the United States was the 1889 failure of the South Fork Dam on the Connemaw River near Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which killed 2,209 people, the largest loss of civilian lives in a single day in the United States until September 11, 2001. Other notable dam break floods in the U.S. included failures of the St. Francis Dam near Santa Clarita, California in the L.A. area in 1923, which killed about 600 people, and the Teton Dam failure near Rexburg, Idaho in 1976, which killed 11. Dam break floods can also occur following natural events that create temporary dams, such as ice jams, glaciers, earthquakes, and landslides. In the United States alone, annual flood damage to property in current dollars averages over $8 billion a year, and if crop losses are included, the annual average tops $20 billion a year and you can see that there's an increasing trend with time over the last 80 years or so. Despite increasing expenditures for flood hazard mitigation, the trend in flood damage is still increasing. This is due in part to the increasing value of real estate, in part to population growth in general, and perhaps in part to changing climate that puts more heat energy into the atmosphere and may be contributing to more frequent and larger storms. But the primary reason for the increasing trend in flood damages is our propensity to keep putting people and expensive structures in flood prone areas. Why do we do this? Because most of the time, flood prone areas are attractive sites near aesthetically pleasing rivers and streams. After nearly every destructive flood, local communities and the federal government wrestle with the question of how to balance economic development and the freedom to put things where you'd like with the need to keep people and structures out of risk-prone areas such as floodplains. The Netherlands is a country that has hundreds of years of experience in dealing with this question and has spent billions of dollars on flood protection projects such as dikes, dams, pumps, and storm surge barriers. In recent years, partly in response to a growing awareness that a changing climate and rising sea level are likely to exacerbate future flooding, this country has decided to move people and structures 
farther away from the rivers. The concept, called Room for the River, incorporates undeveloped floodways into urban and rural planning. Not all flooding is caused by rivers. Along the coasts, gradual flooding can be caused by rising sea level or sinking land or both. Catastrophic coastal flooding, one of the most destructive types, can be caused by hurricanes and typhoons. Examples shown here include the Galveston hurricane of 1900, which killed six to 8,000 people over several days, and the typhoon that struck the Philippines in 2013, which is estimated to have killed about 10,000 people. Another type of coastal flooding disaster can be triggered by earthquakes near or under the sea. Tsunamis, sometimes known as tidal waves, are the result of such an event. A tsunami is triggered by a sudden displacement of water by earth movement, such as an earthquake. The energy from the displacement can travel rapidly through the ocean long distances fairly quickly to adjacent land masses. The arrival of the wave at land first causes the water level at the shore to drop as though the water were being drained away. The wave itself then arrives in force as a wall of water moving rapidly inland. Other types of storms besides rainstorms and hurricanes can cause water-related disasters. Blizzards have their own set of problems related to water in frozen form. And hailstorms each year cause millions of dollars of damage to houses, cars, and crops, especially in parts of the country subject to heavy thunderstorms. Not all water-related disasters involve too much water. On the opposite end of the spectrum, drought is a frequent type of disaster as well. Drought develops slowly and may persist for months or years. Sometimes it's hard to tell when a drought begins. A long drought may even include periods of brief flooding. One of the primary means of mitigating droughts is through water storage projects but a multi-year drought can exhaust the stored supply in even large reservoirs. Droughts result in large costs for lost crops nearly every year in the U.S. and in other countries too. One of the best ways to deal with droughts <coughs> is to obtain and disseminate accurate information about them. In the U.S., this function is provided by the U.S. Drought Monitor. In addition to water quantity, water quality can also be involved in water-related disasters. Unfortunately, spills of hazardous materials into rivers, lakes, and aquifers is a common occurrence. One notable example is the 1986 fire and subsequent release of toxic chemicals from a factory near Basel, Switzerland, into the Rhine River. The spill turned the river red for many miles, killed thousands of fish, and interrupted the supply of drinking water in several countries. Farther east in Europe, a spill of toxic sludge into the Markal River in Hungary, a tributary to the Danube, also resulted in severe damage to the aquatic ecosystem and drinking water supplies. In conclusion, Floods are part of a natural regime of a river, but when they encounter people and structures, they can be very destructive. We're gradually learning to avoid putting people and structures at risk in flood-prone areas, which is the best way in the long term to mitigate flood losses. Floods can also be caused by failure of artificial and natural dams and by hurricanes and tsunamis. And other serious water-related disasters include blizzards, hailstorms, drought, and chemical spills. Thank you.